1938. In Washington, our military leaders, well aware of the growing tension in the Pacific, are proposing to a disturbed Congress the development of the defenses of Guam. With the expansion of harbor facilities and airfields, Guam can become our most defensible forward bastion against the coming aggression. Checkmate to the Japanese-held islands of Saipan, Tinian, and Rota. Facts not unknown to Tokyo. For among the things which must be accomplished if Japan's dream of conquest is to be, are the invasion of the Philippines, destruction of the American fleet, and the capture of Guam. Thus anchored against attack from the east, the Japanese forces can sweep southward toward Australia. As proponents of the expansion submit their estimates, the enemy counters with a well-planned, well-timed propaganda barrage. Japan will consider any such construction as an unfriendly act. The cards have been dealt. Bluff at international level pays off. Quick to seize his advantage, the enemy rushes construction of secret fortifications and airfields on Saipan, Tinian, and Rota, all in the Marianas all within easy bombing range of Guam, all in violation of the Washington Naval Conference, all ready for the day. Guam, blue chip of Pacific defense, has been lost in the game of international poker. General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. The history of Guam is synonymous with unpreparedness. In 1521, it was discovered by Magellan, who reported its value to Spain. The Spaniards promptly invaded, captured, and failed to fortify it. In 1898, the USS Charleston, en route to the Philippines, stopped off and advised the Spanish governor that we were at war with his country. He was powerless to oppose us, and Guam had its second honor in modern history. Later, we paid Spain $20 million for the right to keep it and Puerto Rico. But history repeated itself. We, too, neglected its defenses with sad and far-reaching results. Since the presidential order of December 23, 1898, the administration of the civil affairs of Guam has been under the control of its naval commandant, usually a captain. To give the natives a voice in the administration of their affairs, the Council of Advisors is established. Although military development of Guam is held in abeyance, much is done to improve the lives of the native population. At the Washington Naval Conference of 1922, Japan and the United States pledge their sacred national honors that neither will fortify their holdings in the Central Pacific. Our promise is kept. The only troops stationed on the island are those of the tiny marine garrison who, together with the militia force of native Chamorros, compose Guam's entire defensive strength. By 1941, the native population has more than doubled from the original 9,000 that were on the island when the Navy took over. Under the paternal and benevolent American administration, they are a kindly, industrious, happy people. Their population is spread one-half in the capital city of Vagana, 3,000 in the villages within a 10-mile radius, and the remainder in coastal villages and farming areas. But 
to most Americans of the 1930s, Guam is a faraway outpost, the center of cable communications, a clipper stop on the way to Manila. To the Japanese high command, it is the only base save Pearl Harbor, which can pose a direct threat to their coming Pacific operations. On December 8, 1941, Japan makes her move. The only weapons larger than a 30 caliber available to the garrison are the anti-aircraft guns of the minesweeper USS Penguin. She is the first target. is sunk. Her survivors join the garrison ashore. The attack continues through the daylight hours. 80 Guamanians of the Insular Force Guard muster in Agana to protect the government buildings against the anticipated land attack. The 28 Marines of the Insular Patrol man their posts throughout the island. On Orote Peninsula, the six officers, one warrant officer and 118 enlisted Marines, the complement of the Marine Barrack Sume under Lieutenant Colonel McNulty, take positions in the butts of the rifle range on the Marine Reservation. The defenders of Guam, all 655 of them, face toward the sea. Face toward invasion. Face toward 5,900 Japanese. Rather than jeopardize the lives of the civilians in the face of overwhelming odds, the island commander surrenders the island to the Japanese naval commander shortly after 0600, December 9th. Guam has fallen in mere hours. At first, the Japanese make an effort to gain the friendship of the Guamanians. Their first antagonistic move is to change the name of the island. Further dictums are forthcoming. Schools will teach Japanese instead of English. Strict rationing will be instituted. Entire families will be punished for any disobedience of the individual. When the Japanese begin to build up the defenses, the Guamanians are pressed into forced labor gangs. When Japanese army units begin returning to the island as reinforcements in 1944, all pretense is dropped. Worship of God is forbidden and schools are closed. All food supplies are seized. Forced labor demands increase. On a starvation diet, and no diet for those too aged a week to wake. Finally, all people living in the military area are ordered from their homes, sent inland to the concentration camps. Medical supplies are limited. Sanitation non-existent. Hundreds died. This is what happened to the children. These people were our friends. They looked to us for protection. This was their lot. Such was Guam's introduction to Japan's greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. Early spring of 1944. By now, our Pacific campaign was well underway. Guadalcanal, the Solomon, New Britain. 
Garden. Gilbert's. And the marshals were all behind. We were ready for the first major reconquest of Japanese held American territory. In planning the invasion of Guam, we planned to apply certain tactical maneuvers which had proven so effective at Saipan. Terrain maps were made and distributed to the troops so they would be familiar with their objectives. Our army companion, the 77th Division, was raw with no previous experience, but it showed combat efficiency to a degree one would expect only of veteran troops. Its aggressive patrolling, close coordination with other units, and superior conduct of assigned missions gave evidence of its good training, fine leadership, and high morale. When we call on the 77 to move, it moved, and it moved fast. I pay them tribute now because this story is only of the Marines' participation in the recapture. north of Opera Harbor. The 3rd Battalion, 21st Marines, moves rapidly inward and secures its first objective, a low height of land behind the pulverized town of Assam. The 2nd Battalion meets heavier going. Heat and long shipboard confinement have taken their toll of physical stamina. But they will not be stopped. Artillery pins them down. They hang on grimly as the 3rd Battalion moves up on their right, and the 1st consolidates the sector behind them. The 9th Marines on the extreme right accomplish their several objectives by carrying forward, establishing the right perimeter beyond the beach area, securing Habras Island, and extending the right flank of the causeway. withering fire. Inch by inch we win a hill, only to find a higher one just ahead, which also must be taken. expand, the lines grow thin. Requests for reinforcements are denied because of the strong resistance being met by the southern forces. At night, shore parties, pioneers, engineers, bandsmen, cooks, wandering sailors, anyone who can be collected is used for night security. The Japanese were unpredictable. Their attack of D plus five was carefully planned and organized. We 
threw the book at them, but they kept coming. On the right, they attacked the battalion command post before we even knew they'd achieved the breakthrough. Every Marine fought. Our cooks are fighters first, and cooks second, so they grabbed their weapons. Service troops rolled hand grenades down on the enemy. Everyone fought. The first provisional brigade under the command of Brigadier General Lemuel C. Shepard, Jr. has landed between the village of Agat and Bangi Point. Bangi Point is well named. We lose 20 Amtraks to enemy fire. a beachhead perimeter and reinforce for counterattacks from the south. The 22nd is to land on the left, secure that end of the perimeter, and drive northward to cut off the neck of Orate Peninsula. The 305th Infantry will land behind assault regiments, move through assault units, and take over a sector of the line. By nightfall, the 4th Marines reach the foot of Mount Oliphant. Tanks operate through the groves and help to withstand the first night's counterattack. They drive us off hill number 40. Reinforcements help retake it. prepared positions and deep. The front over which we must advance is narrow, bounded on the right by the cliffs, on the left by the sea. They know where we are, and they are ready. They are depending on their tanks to stop us, but they are no match for our own. Our bazookas, or even in certain spots, our machine guns. We can also stop them by tossing grenades in their tracks. Naval gunfire and artillery pour into areas ahead of us. Our planes bomb and strafe. to safety. But the main work is for the foot marine, and we work at it. For six days we work at it. begin to see signs of their cracking. On the eighth day, we retake the old marine barracks. As we 
we stand on the site which was a resistance point for other Marines in 1941, we are heartened. They are avenged. Nearby is the flagpole. Proudly we unfurl the flag, hoist it to the heavens. Significantly, the call to colors is played on a captured Japanese bugle, whose owner is not present to object. By D plus 20, organized resistance is over. Mopping up will continue for months. According to the logistics of planning, the invader must be prepared to lose two men to one of the enemy. If this had happened to the Marines and the 77th Armor Division, American casualties would have been over 36,000 as the enemy lost over 18,000 killed and 485 prisoners. Our actual loss was 1,519 Marines, 178 Army and 50 Navy dead. For every American dead, the enemy lost 10 men. This extremely low casualty ratio was not an accident. It was a result of the heavy, accurate naval gunfire and aerial bombing which knocked out emplacements before we landed. It was a result of careful planning by the admirals and generals who managed to achieve tactical surprise by hitting where we were not expected. It was a result of conditioning exercises which kept us in top physical condition. It was a result of rigid training that builds confidence in your ability to overcome the adversary. It was a result of perfecting the techniques of assault to reduce with minimum losses. It was a result of better equipment, more firepower, ample supply. It was a result of raw courage, which in turn is the result of faith. Around us, we see the evidence of Japanese culture, emaciation, starvation, forced labor, massacre, lack of medicine, sanitation, decent living conditions of personal freedom. It is new to us, yet it is familiar. It is a master photograph of rule by dictation. Asan is Bushinwar. Sumai is Ladici, Aganya is Warsaw. Piti is every city where the oppressor in the name of freedom has liberated the populace into slavery. The faces that stare at us are the faces of Poland, Czechoslovakia, of Eastern Germany, for the expression of oppression is the same everywhere. We have seen it on Guam. We have seen it in Korea. We hope it will end there. But as ever, we stand ready to oppose this smothering of freedmen. We are Americans, Marines. It is October 31st, 1943. Above, friendly planes, scouting, defending, protecting. Below, friendly submarines, sounding, listening, accompanying. Around us, friendly men of war, darting, deploying, ready. And if this enemy pilot spots our convoy, he will be chased, but not destroyed. Until he had radioed our location. The information that we are following a northwesterly course. At 1600, we will steer toward the Shortland Islands. And the Japanese will assume that our landing will be made on Choiselle, or the southern tip of Bougainville. He will be wrong. Under the cover of the friendly darkness, we will change our course and move swiftly through the moonless night to our real objective, 
Empress Augusta Bay. Here is your host, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. General Smith, did the Bougainville landing achieve the desired element of surprise? In so far as its location, yes. Thanks to its masterful planning, clever deception, and flawless execution. It caught the enemy with his plans at half-mast. And before he could diagnose our real objective, we had time to dig in, expand our perimeter, and get our supplies ashore and disperse. To keep a chicken from flying, you clip his wings. So several days before the invasion, Marine, Army, and Navy planes poured tons of bombs onto every enemy airfield within striking distance of our supplies objective, Empress Augusta Bay. busy defending themselves that they were unable to mount a disruptive attack until later. The day is clear. At 6.14 a.m., the minesweepers go in, clearing lanes 6,000 yards ahead of the transports. They report all clear of mines and sufficient water. Upon reaching a point 3,000 yards off Cape Torakina, each transport executes a 100 degree turn to port and takes the point under three inch gunfire. later, the barrage is lifted. The order to land the landing force is given at 0645, and 7,500 Marines take their places in the LCVPs and LCMs, ready for the 1,500-yard run to the beach. The destroyers Anthony, Terry, Wadsworth, and Sigourney commence their prearranged fires. This fire ceases, and 31 TBFs of Marine Air Group 14, based at Munda, bomb and straight until 726. Boats of the 3rd Marines come in line with Pura Atta Island. They are taken under three-way machine gun fire from the Cape, the western tip of Pura Atta Island, and Torakina Island. Raider Battalion, less Company L, lands on Pura Atta Island and starts mopping up the anti-boat defenses. The enemy keeps them under pressure. One by one, the machine guns are silenced. Then, 
the snipers. It is a two-day job. Meanwhile, as the boats of the 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines, continue past Pura Atta Island, they are again under machine gun and rifle fire from Cape Torokina. As they near the shore, another voice is heard. Its fire is deadly. 50 high explosive shells score a batting average of 280. 14 boats are hit. Four destroyed. Among them, that of the group commander. And the assault waves become disorganized. Companies of the 1st Battalion are landed in practically reverse order. These could have been the seeds of disaster. By this time, entire organizations were broken up. Platoons and companies were thrown out of position by being landed on the wrong part of the beach. Contact was lost between companies. The battalion lost its communications and therefore control of its subordinate units. In time of crisis, will I lift up a man. And a man is lifted up. Then two. And then a score. Individuals thoroughly trained as small unit leaders. Individuals who know the mission. Individuals who are ready and willing to take charge in a crisis. And because every Marine has been thoroughly indoctrinated and briefed on the plan, purpose, and overall strategy of the maneuver, each is able to carry out the mission of the sector in which he finds himself. And as this unity of individuals encompasses neighbor, spontaneity of effort replaces chaos. Confusion gives way to achievement. The battle gains momentum, gathers objectivity, and proceeds without any further direction from higher echelon. The Marines had been landed in the wrong place. The situation was not well in hand. Coconut logs and sand. Banzai and a box score of 280. Other boats are on their way. Another dozen to be sacrificed on the altar of enemy marksmanship. Unless something is done and done quickly. There is no artillery ashore. There is no time to call for naval gunfire. One unit of A Company, 3rd Marines, lands near the deadly gun. Their objective is to their left, but the 75 is on their right. There is no hesitation. Up the draw past the flanking riflemen, a sergeant and four Marines. Then two. Forget the book. Snap the pin, hold and take the count. Toss one. Nothing. Again. It is not enough. Pride. History. Tradition. Esprit de corps. And a new page is written in Marine Corps history. I've always marveled at the devotion one Marine has for his fellow Marines. The honor of their passion is written in the hearts and memories of those who love them. Those who were privileged to fight beside them are a grateful nation. A sergeant and four men become none, but the lethal voice of the 75 is still. Our intent is known. Our strategy fathomed. Our enemy gathers his fleet. 
if he can sink or destroy our smaller force, the Marines will be severed from supply. Reinforcement. As night falls, we are silent, thoughtful. On the back of the outgunned American Navy rides Marine victory or defeat on Bougainville. The darkness becomes taut, then oppressive, then shatters. It is 27 minutes past midnight on the morning of November 2nd. Rear Admiral Amori has begun his battle for annihilation. Theirs or ours? Two down. One and one or two and nothing. And who's nothing? The star shells and flares are theirs. For the smaller American force seeks the anonymity of obscurity. Once before on such a night, another man imprisoned within his immediate confines and restrained from the conflict distilled from anxiety the words which are now so meaningful. Then, as the dark hulls climb the horizon and slide down on our side of the ocean, our flag is still there. Admiral Merrill had been superior to the challenge. When enemy flares revealed his position, he laid down a smoke screen to distort and confuse. And the enemy gunners, who had only optical control, were able to damage only three of our ships. Our radar control fire found the enemy wherever he tried to hide. The Japanese lost two by sinking, had three damaged, and hastily withdrew. Every Marine on Bougainville was mighty proud of the Navy that night. Bougainville has two seasons, wet and wetter. The average fall is nine and a half inches per month, seven of which sometimes fall in 24 hours. This is our introduction to the rain forest, and it rains every day for 17 days. As the perimeter is extended, the only vehicle which can transport supplies and bring out the wounded is the amphibian tractor. We wade in mud, fight in mud, fall in mud, and sleep in mud. But the battle goes on. On November 7th, the first Japanese reinforcements arrive, land, dig in, and have to be dug out. The captain commanding B Company speaks Japanese. He moves along in an exposed position. Banzai shouts, then the dutiful enemy charges into the withering fire of his machine gun. Captain loses a leg by his bravery, but he builds up a firing line and prevents infiltration by the Japanese.
After two days of such fighting, we reach positions for an all-out effort. Five batteries of artillery, mortars, anti-tank weapons, and machine guns are brought to bear upon their positions. lifted, the Battle of Coromokina Lagoon has been won. Marine air units help in the mopping up operation. We have come to seize, enlarge, secure, and anchor a perimeter wherein airstrips may be built. The work begins on November 9. Roads are hastily constructed so there will be no constriction of supply. Communications are expanded. Supplies dispersed to avoid bomb damage. Installations are constructed. Fighting continues. Any overland reinforcement must come via the Piva, East-West, or Numa Numa trails. We move quickly toward their junction. In the rainforest, you can step on the enemy before you see him. Their roadblock on the Piva trail takes three days to overcome. begins the Battle of the Coconut Grove. On the 14th, it is secured, and we own the junction of the trails. Beginning with the Battle of the Piva Fort on the 19th of November, it was all uphill fighting for the Marines. Civic Ridge, Hill 1000, held the Popping Ridge, Hill 600, Hill 600A. It is difficult to maneuver men and supplies through an almost impenetrable jungle. Units as large as companies can become separated and out of contact. But by November the 23rd, in spite of attacks, counterattacks, the jungle, rain, mud and fever, the 3rd Marines had maneuvered into position for attack. From the height of Civic Ridge, they located 1,100 men of the Japanese 23rd Regiment concentrated in an area 800 yards square. The Marines and elements of the 37th Infantry Division U.S. Army had moved seven battalions of artillery 44 machine guns, 12 81 millimeter mortars, and 9 60 millimeter mortars into place and registered them on all probable enemy positions. they fired 5,760 rounds into the area. When the barrage and the assault were finished, the Imperial Japanese 23rd Regiment was no more. 
We had come to seize, enlarge, secure, and anchor a perimeter wherein airstrips could be built. During November, we had 90 alerts, 22 bombings, and fought four major engagements. At dawn of December 10, Marine Air Group VMF-216 lands to make its permanent base. Seven days later, four Army P-39s will do the same. By December 15, most of the fireworks are over for the Marines. Elements of the Army's 37th and Americal divisions have been arriving and fighting beside us since November 9. Ten days before Christmas 1943, Command of the Torakina area passes from Major General Roy S. Geiger, 1st Marine Amphibious Corps, to Major General Oscar W. Griswold, United States Army. As rapidly as practical, Marine units are relieved. In 45 days, the Marines had achieved that portion of the victory at Bougainville. But they were leaving no better road. The biggest battles on Bougainville were fought by the United States Army in the early spring of 1944. Their valor and efficiency are recorded in the decisive manner in which they won. We were all on the same team, and teamwork won the Battle of Bougainville.